Okay, so we have a lot to cover today. This is um, AONM's um, first, actually, in the series of webinars during Lyme Awareness Month. And we're delighted to have Professor Craig Shimazaki here with us today. I'm sure most of you have uh, seen him previously in webinars of ours. Um, he's going to talk today about the rise in infections post-COVID and our immune response, linking those particularly to autoimmune encephalopathies and um, other uh, conditions uh, for which his lab specializes. He's the co-founder and CEO of Molecular Labs, which is a neuroimmunology precision medicine company that focuses on identifying the underlying roots of neurological psychiatric and behavioral disorders that are triggered by infections and an autoimmune response. He's an adjunct professor at the University of Oklahoma and has spent over 35 years working in the fields of molecular biology, viral pathogenesis, and infection-triggered autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders. So as usual, please do put any questions that occur to you in the either chat box or um, the Q&As at the bottom. He'll be speaking for about 45 minutes, and after that, we'll have ample time for questions. So, uh, Professor Shimazaki, thank you very much indeed. Over to you. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, speak with you and be here again today. Uh, thank you to AONM and for all your work in educating and helping people to understand more about these different neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, let me make sure I can pull up my slides. All right. So uh, I trust you can see those. Uh, so today I want to share with you a little bit about the after effects of COVID uh, in the sense that there are a rise of other types of infections. The world has been heavily focused on COVID during the past couple of years. And uh, there are a lot of things that have happened uh, that uh, in the wake of COVID, such as other infections that have arisen and then our immune response and things such as we know about long COVID. But I wanna talk about how these other infections can have an impact on our immune system. And in particular things uh, that would contribute to what we call autoimmune encephalitis, autoimmune encephalopathy. So my disclaimer is the content just made for informational purposes only, and it's not provided or intended to be medical or healthcare advice. So if uh, we, the recommendation is to seek a medical professional uh, for advice on a specific medical problem and also from a qualified healthcare provider. So today we're going to cover four topics. One is the COVID-19 aftermath. And then the resurgence of uh, various types of infections, such as respiratory syncytial virus, influenza, group A strep, even the herpes viruses, and then the increase in scarlet fever, particularly in children. Uh, we'll speak a little bit about uh, streptococcal infections and how our immune system responds through a process we call molecular mimicry uh, that contributes to these post sequelae, which is uh, such as Sydenham Korea. Uh, acute rheumatic fever, pandas and pans, and other types of autoimmune encephalitis. Then we'll address the question, can infections trigger autoimmune antibodies that result in uh, various types of neuropsychiatric and behavioral symptoms? And then we'll close with some more detailed scientific and clinical information about certain types of targets in the brain that we test for in a panel that we call the Cunningham panel and their connection to various symptoms. And then we'll talk a little bit about the therapies uh, that, that broadly uh, show clinical effectiveness in individuals with these conditions. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a little bit of allergies, so I might have to clear my throat here. <clears throat> so uh, looking at the uh, post-COVID-19 aftermath, we all are aware of the various um, kinds of things that have occurred during uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic. The Johns Hopkins University has a dashboard that they've kept <clears throat> beginning in January, 2020 through March, 2023. Uh, the total number of cases that they have at least collected and identified through the various 
uh, countries and even down to the different locales and providences uh, are over 676 million cases, 6.8 million deaths, and uh, over 13 billion vaccine doses had been administered. But what we also know that COVID has changed the lifestyle and actually how we operate on a daily basis. And some of the societal impacts of COVID-19 include <clears throat> isolation, a lot of remote work, uh, and many companies have gone to totally remote work, uh, the increase in online commerce, uh, a very large number of businesses uh, closing, going out of business. There has been some interesting good things that have happened during that period of time, lower CO2 emissions, almost a 6% decrease during 2020, um, but that has been wiped out and, and no longer uh, as after things have opened up again, uh, we don't see that anymore. Uh, there were problems with education, challenges in educating children and uh, students in the universities. And then also we know the long-term health challenges of long COVID, which we'll briefly speak about some of the underlying infections that are related to that and then impact on mental health. But today, what I wanna to talk to you about is really the, un uh, the increase in other infectious diseases um, that uh, almost seemingly disappeared uh, during uh, the pandemic period. So before we go there, <clears throat> one of the things that we did see and uh, is continuing to be evident is that during COVID and even in patients that have long COVID and experienced fatigue, that there's been an increase of various types of herpes viruses uh, from Epstein-Barr uh, to uh, herpes simplex type one and two, uh, varicella zoster. And what you can see here in some of the data is that in patients with long COVID, they've identified uh, the patients had positive for Epstein-Barr virus DNA compared to a control group. We do know that the herpes viruses reside in the neurologic system and they can be reactivated. And in these cases, this seems to be what's happening in these long COVID patients and as well as herpes simplex reactivation. In this uh, study, they said our study shows a high incidence of HSV-1 reactivation both virologically and clinically in patients with SARS-CoV-2 severe pneumonia. Another study looking at varicella zoster and viral encephalitis, COVID-19 can potentially cause reactivation in varicella zoster and sub subsequently have an additive effect in the neurologic complications. So we know that uh, herpes virus is one of those uh, families of viruses to pay attention to and it's especially in patients that might be suffering from long COVID. Then there's the post-COVID syndromes and in infections. Uh, we've seen increases in other infections after the pandemic. Um, these include influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, uh, and streptococcal infections of various kind. Uh, and some of the data is showing us that respiratory syncytial virus dramatically dropped uh, during COVID and researched after the pandemic. What you see down here uh, is the RSV rate during COVID in this red line. And then this black line is what the average RSV rates are during uh, the number of different weeks during the year. And what we also see is that once the pandemic and the restrictions lifted, a uh, huge rise in respiratory syncytial virus infections. Uh, again, respiratory syncytial virus has been around for a long, long time. Uh, they tend to be uh, more uh, identified in children and then the elderly, but RSV uh, can and is and can be um, uh, very severe in the young and the elderly. In this particular study, <clears throat> you can see here in Australia, uh, there is uh, changes in the rates of RSV in this, in, in this country, uh, both uh, before and afterwards, after uh, restrictions were eased. The same thing occurred with influenza. 
Uh, what you can see here is the dramatic drop in flu cases uh, during uh, the peak of the pandemic. And whereas these were the average flu cases in many, all the years prior from mid 2015 to 2019. And, um, uh, you know, nicely though, uh, the dramatic drop in pediatric flu deaths uh, plummeted during the pandemic. In 2021 in particular, there was only one uh, pediatric flu death during that period of time in the United States. Um, when we look at strep, the cases of strep throat dramatically dropped during COVID-19 and then resurged during the pandemic. These are different uh, age ranges here. And what you can see here is that once the restrictions lifted, um, you see a huge increase in uh, strep throat in ages four to nine, uh, in here from nine to 13, and uh, it impacted all ages. Strep throat, as we know, is something that generally most children uh, will encounter and maybe have a course of about anywhere from 95 to 98% of the children. Um, another interesting uh, correlation is scarlet fever, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a moment. Uh, in England, uh, between 2017 and 2018, uh, you can see the dotted lines back here, the baseline, and then the change in scarlet fever in 2021, 2020, uh, 20, sorry, 2022 and 2023, a huge increase in the incidence of scarlet fever was identified in England. So kind of back uh, track just a little bit, what is strep? Um, because strep has been around for a long time. Um, strep is just short for streptococcus. It's a type of bacteria. Um, and there are at least four types or categories. We name them A, B, C, and G. Why it's G, I don't know. It may be because D and E and F uh, were not there. Uh, but two of them cause most of the infections in people. We call them group A and group B streptococcus. There's another particular uh, component to streptococcus, and that is whether or not they hemolyze red blood cells, meaning do they secrete uh, a certain type of protein that will destroy red blood cells? And these are called beta hemolytic. Uh, and what you can see is beta hemolytic actually clears out uh, a red blood cell auger plate. So you can see really a lot of clearing because they will destroy the red blood cells, some not so much, and then others not at all. In particular, what we're going to really focus on uh, is group A streptococcus, otherwise known as GAS, G-A-S, uh, because it's responsible for strep throat, scarlet fever, uh, empatigo, toxic shock, cellulitis, and necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, but group B strep can also cause other types of infections, blood infections, pneumonia, meningitis in newborns, UTIs, skin infections, pneumonia in adults. Um, but we're going to specifically focus here on the group A strep or GAS, uh, and in particular, uh, strep pyogenes. And so strep pyogenes is the full name of the culprit. Uh, that is typically identified and found in uh, strep throat scarlet fever. So what is scarlet fever? Uh, it's been around for a long time. Um, back in the 1600s, uh, Thomas Sydenham, who also identified or named after Sydenham Korea, which was also a strep-induced uh, 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 condition that we'll talk about also in a second, um, so scarlet fever uh, was something that affected and infected uh, a lot of individuals, and particularly a lot of children. The symptoms included sore throat, fever, uh, these swollen neck glands, and the red rash that you can see on the skin, the face, and particularly a red tongue, sometimes called a strawberry tongue. And uh, today, you can uh, certainly uh, take a, a strep test, uh, a rapid test. If that's not positive, you'd check for a culture uh, and also a blood test looking for anti-streptolysin O or streptolysin titer. The problem is that uh, only between one week and one month post-infection will the streptolysin O titer be positive. So you wouldn't see that immediately. You would have to see, wait to see that the immune system is mounting a response 
uh, again, this uh, streptolysin uh, that's being emitted from the bacteria. So again, uh, the symptoms for scarlet fever, uh, and, and many of you may be familiar with that, but uh, it's mostly mild uh, and, and it's usually self-limiting. Uh, symptoms sometimes two to four days after exposure. It is contagious uh, through droplets, skin, uh, sharing towels, uh, an upper respiratory infection. You can have heat, headache, fever, rashes, and the rashes can appear 24, 48 hours after your first onset of symptoms. And uh, this is really caused by the toxin that's produced by the group A beta hemolytic strep pyodrenes infection. So the therapy typically is symptomatic treatment, fluids, uh, things to reduce the fever, such as in the US, we call it acetaminophen, uh, and also penicillin typically is given for 10 days. If patients are allergic to penicillin, typically they'll use another antibiotic like erythromycin or clarithromycin. The potential complications uh, uh, are vary, and those are the early, early days, uh, ear infections, throat infections, sinus infections, pneumonia, and even potentially meningitis. Uh, later uh, complications could be related to uh, the immune reaction, which we'll talk about uh, in more detail, rheumatic fever, and glomular uh, nephritis. So streptococcal infections uh, impact our immune system. Our immune system is uh, looking to defend us from foreign invaders, but sometimes through a process called molecular mimicry in certain individuals, the particular immune response is directed against a part of a, uh, the organism that very similar to a part of our body. We'll talk about that in a moment. Sydenham chorea and acute rheumatic fever, and even a condition called PANDAS or PANS and autoimmune encephalitis. <clears throat> so in some individuals, the group A strep infections can result in rheumatic fever uh, and or Sydenham chorea. And again, uh, rheumatic fever is triggered by group A streptococcus. Uh, Sir William Olsler back in the 1800s described these as bizarre and precipitate behaviors in children uh, that also had obsessive compulsive disorder. And even before that, in the 1600s, um, Thomas Sydenham uh, described this also. So what happens is that group A strep in some individuals will elicit antibodies that are directed against a certain portion of the organism that mimics parts of the heart and parts of the brain. And in those conditions, then you have antibodies directed against them resulting in acute rheumatic fever or Sydenham chorea. Uh, it used to be known as St. Vitus's dance um, because it resulted in these choreiform movements that look like dance movements, as you can see here in this picture. But basically, uh, these individuals had a, a loss of fine motor control, loss of emotional control, and these abnormal movements. So how does that really happen from an infection? Well, again, I mentioned molecular mimicry. Um, every organism has specific what we call antigenic determinants or things that we make antibodies against in uh, group A strep. Uh, there are these antigens that are parts of the carbohydrate, parts of the M protein that the organism, the group A strep, uses to both protect itself, but also um, for various uh, virulence factors. What happens, though, when an antibody is made against certain parts of that through a process called molecular mimicry, there are parts in our body that are very similar, or in some cases, identical in sequence to them. Hence, uh, they get cross-reactive antibodies attacking the heart valve, which is what's known as rheumatic fever. You can also get antibodies that cross-react and attack parts of the brain, in particular, the basal ganglia, uh, hence known as Sydenham chorea. There are other areas, the joints, uh, which contribute to arthralgia and pain that people feel, uh, kidneys, glomerular nephritis that was mentioned, and others. <clears throat> so this autoimmune pathway that we call molecular mimicry 
Uh, you can think about this in nature. There's a lot of mimicry that goes on sometimes to camouflage, to protect, but it's one way in which um, there are certain uh, peptides that are in these organisms that are identical to those in our body. So for instance, there are only 20 letters in the protein alphabet, um, just like we only have 23 letters in the regular alphabet. Uh, you see that um, in some cases in these sequences, when you look at two different proteins from two different organisms, there may be a stretch that are identical. And uh, that is just normal. That's the case because you only have so many letters of a protein alphabet. However, our body typically through uh, different types of tolerance uh, tells our immune system not to make those antibodies and not to have those being produced. Whereas in some individuals, unfortunately, they still do get produced. So if you think of autoimmunity or autoimmune disorders or molecular mimicry, as what we might think of as friendly fire in the wartime. <clears throat> what happens is that our, our, one of our strongest forces is now being directed towards ourself. Some of the genes that are involved in this uh, for autoimmune diseases uh, are these major histocompatibility complexes and the HLA human leukocyte antigens, class one and class two. And we also know that uh, a family history of autoimmune dysfunction is typically found in patients uh, that have these immune-mediated disorders or neuropsychiatric disorders that are immune-mediated. So kind of a little bit more at the molecular level, um, as I mentioned, we all make antibodies and really that's what vaccines are attempting to do is to expose us to something so that we will already amount an immune response. The immune response, in this case, to make an antibody, it generally can take weeks to almost a month to us to develop uh, specific antibodies. So for really severe diseases or uh, infections, um, we don't want to be waiting that long before we have a strong immune response. So when we get exposed to various bacteria, let's say it's streptococcal bacteria, uh, these antibodies are then directed against what we call an epitope. It's a specific part of the uh, in organism that it recognizes, and it makes lots of them. Um, in this case, we'll focus on this one. It then goes through maturation. The B cells and the T cells are involved in this process, and then it makes what we call memory B cells. And these memory B cells are what provides sometimes lifelong immunity, sometimes 10 years, sometimes a couple of years, uh, if we ever see that particular organism again. But what happens when that particular epitope is, has an antibody made against it, but that particular epitope is identical or very similar to a part of our body, let's say a neuron. So a neuron in our brain that has that particular sequence and a bacteria such as streptococcus um, uh, has this particular sequence that our antibodies are made against, what will happen then is it will cross-react. And these are cross-reactive antibodies. Sometimes we call them antineuronal antibodies when they're made against neurons. And those are those uh, cells uh, that are in the brain, other parts of the spinal cord, um, <clears throat> when antibodies are made against them, those are things that are not good. So autoimmune response through molecular mimicry would look like this. Here's a, a little funny representation uh, in practical matters. Uh, these two identical twins, one said, you don't get lunch. Mom thought I was you and fed me twice. Um, basically, it's mistaken identity. And the identity is in the case where an immune response is made against a particular part of an infection, it then is directed against that same part that looks identical to that uh, in our body. Now, the interesting thing is there are other infections that are also associated with these types of uh, cross-reactive antibodies. In, in the case where we look at neuropsychiatric disorders and neuropsychiatric symptoms, these include strep, group A strep, influenza A, varicella zoster, 
Mycoplasma, Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella, Coxsackie virus, and several others, and even SARS-CoV-2 lately, uh, which uh, brings about what uh, we all believe is an immune dysfunction triggered by the spike protein um, causing an immune response against our body and various parts of our body. So we come back to the question, can infections really trigger autoimmune antibodies that result in neuropsychiatric symptoms? <clears throat> so a very well-respected journal called JAMA Psychiatry <clears throat> published a study um, about infections with an increase for neuropsychiatric illness in children. A group that uh, studied this in Denmark followed over a million individuals from their birth to age 18. What they found was that if one of them were hospitalized for a severe infection, that the risk of developing mental disorders increased by more than 80% for the diagnosis of schizophrenia, autism, O, 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 obsessive compulsive disorders, ADD, ADHD, personal, personality and behavior disorders, uh, oppositional defiance disorders, and other tick disorders. And so the question was posed, how could infections or exposure to infections affect the brain mechanistically to give rise to mental disorders? Well, the answer was circulating autoantibodies that enter the brain via a compromised blood-brain barrier and then bind to neurotransmitter receptors is a potential explanation. And this mechanism has been proposed in pandas and other mental disorders. And so you remember the antibody that cross-react with a portion of the infection was an identical epitope to those that part of the brain. So if you are not familiar with pandas, uh, we're not talking about the marsupial. Uh, we're talking about uh, an acronym for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with a Streptococcal Infection. And uh, this was identified or at least described um, in the late 90s in a cohort of children um, by Dr. Susan Sweeto at the National Institutes of Mental Health. What we do know and find out that uh, pandas uh, and pans, which is, uh, I'll talk a bit more about how they're related, um, is it's estimated that one out of 150 or 200 children may have this. It's characterized by an abrupt onset of OCD or restricted food intake. Uh, and that's also an OCD. It's a fear of food contamination or food phobia. Uh, the other would be uh, at least two of the following is how it's diagnosed, anxiety, emotional ability or depression, irritability, aggression, or oppositional behaviors, developmental regression, deterioration in school performance, cognitive changes, sensory or motor abnormalities, other signs like sleep disturbances, uh, bedwetting, increased urinary frequency, other neurologic symptoms um, such as Sydenham chorea. And the average age for this is uh, anywhere from six and a half to seven and a half years. Boys number outnumber girls 2.6 to one. However, in our clinical testing, uh, we also identify and have found older, uh, older children, uh, but also young adults and even older adults that have had a uh, new onset of these types of disorders. So if you're familiar with pandas, you might be familiar with sometimes there is a belief of a controversy and the controversy has to do with, um, do they have strep or don't they have strep and why do 98% uh, of children get strep and not all of them get pandas? Well, there is a correlation um, versus a causation. So if you look at the ASO titers, which is a good indicator of whether or not there's a strep infection, and this Y box score, which is the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Disorder Scale. You can see that it parallels when the titers of the antibodies in the children uh, rise. And there is no correlation here, but a patient still may have a high Y box score, but no correlation. So uh, this is why part of the reason PANS was coined is because PANS is not just related to strep. And I'm gonna share with you here how the nomenclature can be confusing because pandas 
is limited to streptococcal infections. So if you have another infection, a different infection from another microbe like Lyme, Mycoplasma, Babesia, Bartonella, you can't have pandas because pandas is strep. Um, but these also can be or believed to be triggered by environmental factors. Uh, so you have these infectious and non-infectious triggers, which is where the term PANS came from. And PANS, it refers to pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndromes. Well, what happens if you're not a child? Well, um, you can't have PANDAS or you can't have PANS, um, but you can have an infection triggered autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder. There have been others who have coined other terms like ANDL, autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with Lyme or associated in adults. Uh, and what we're finding is that the term basal ganglia encephalitis or autoimmune encephalopathy or even autoimmune encephalitis will tend to be used more frequently because it takes away um, the reference to a single organism and the age of the individual. Because what we're looking at in these cases is an infection mediated immune reaction that is triggering these, in these cases, neuropsychiatric symptoms. So there's been studies that have been done looking at brain inflammation in children that have obsessive compulsive disorder and other types of tics that are associated with a streptococcal infection. And what you see here is a comparison to normal children and the elevated uh, volume in the caudate, the putamen, the globus pallidus, which is part of the basal ganglia here, but not the thalamus, which is not part of the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia, interestingly, is responsible for motor control, voluntary motor control. Hence, you can see um, Sydenham Korea, procedural learning and cognitive functions. Often we see brain fog and things in these patients, emotional functions, and even eye movement. So there is, a, there is a correlation between the functions of the basal ganglia and these antibodies that are directed against these uh, parts of the brain. There is also, which we won't go into too much, in our lab, we have looked at sequence comparison of the dopamine D1 and D2 loop. These are neurologic receptors in the brain and the sequence homology, meaning between the sequence of the protein letter alphabet in uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein open reading frame. So we have identified and do see that there are overlapping sequence homology between them, which would lead to or tend to believe um, that the antibodies directed against those particular parts of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein would or could cross-react with these dopamine D1 and D2 receptors in the brain. So this brings us to the summary here of what are the biological targets that we find that are typically positive where patients are having antibodies directed against. We call that the Cunningham panel or an autoimmune encephalitis panel. And then what are the symptoms that are associated with that? And then what therapies or categories of therapies have shown to be clinically effective in treating patients uh, or patients uh, in individuals with these conditions? So the result of this is uh, uh, over 20 years of research into Sydenham Korea and streptococcal research that identified four biomarker targets and a cell stimulatory assay that leads to uh, what we see as autoimmune encephalitis or autoimmune encephalopathy. So this is a test result of uh, a panel uh, which we run the clinical laboratory here in the research park at the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center. And uh, we get blood literally from all over the world, including um, your partner out there, uh, AONM, which we'll talk about later. Um, they're directed against these five targets, dopamine D1, dopamine D2 receptor. I'll talk a bit more about what they do and what they are. The lysoganglioside, the tubulin, and the calmodulin cam kinase activity. So in the pre and the post synaptic uh, neurons, 
there are uh, dopaminergic or dopamine D1 and D2 receptors that have specific functions. They also um, can be blocked or can be inhibited or interfered with by these antibodies that are directed against them. And so can lysoganglioside and then interfere or actually upregulate and activate this enzyme that's involved in increasing dopamine in the brain. So practically, here are some of the cases of which we have hundreds of these. This one is a 24-year-old young man who started developing OCD and tics, and he lost 30 pounds, couldn't concentrate. He had one positive, and uh, this is why we run all five of them, because we don't know what symptoms they have and what they will correlate with. The patient was treated with uh, IVIG or intravenous immunoglobulin and plasma phoresis, which basically was to moderate the immune system. All of them went back to normal and the patient's symptoms were resolved. This is a nine-year-old girl who started developing OCD and verbal tics and stimming, which is an autism-like behavior. Uh, sensory and motor abnormality started bedwetting. Uh, dysgraphia, difficulty writing, drawing. Two of the positives in this case uh, were positive, two tests, and one was borderline. And the patient actually had, uh, in this one, I believe we saw, uh, an early, caught it early, uh, and the patient was treated just with an antibiotic, and uh, all her symptoms rapidly improved. Another young uh, woman who had more chronic condition suffered for quite a long time, uh, was Lyme disease positive. She was complaining of brain problems and inability to think and concentrate. She had three positives. In this case, they needed to treat the Lyme and also treat the immune system. And when they did, all of her antibodies went back to normal and she was fully recovered. And one last one, a nine-year-old uh, young man, 30 days after a strep infection, started developing OCD motor tics, couldn't concentrate, uh, anxiety, uh, bedwetting, uh, and a whole host of symptoms that were rather concerning. Uh, in this case, one positive, and uh, this patient was treated with intravenous immunoglobulin, and with one month, all of the symptoms were eliminated, and all their antibodies went back to normal. We do see many more amazing recoveries when they're properly diagnosed and treated that we have a host of these stories on our website at molecularlabs.com. This was a young girl who at age eight was uh, diagnosed with a mental disorder wanting to kill herself. Parents looked and looked to try to find answers. We eventually, uh, they found us, we tested her, her treatment was changed and not too long ago, her mom sent us a picture of her completely well, back to normal life and on the cheer team. So in the remaining uh, time here, I wanna share with you a clinical study that you can uh, pick up in the, the report and we'll provide a link to it. But it was using the panel to correlate with these antibodies and looking at if the symptoms correlated with these antibodies and what was the accuracy. So patients that either had, um, well, had two tests or more, uh, one, um, two tests before, one and after treatment, and we found out whether or not they improved or did not improve. So this was not a treatment study, but it was just to see whether or not the accuracy of these particular targets correlated with symptom improvement. One interesting finding, which is very important to what we've discussed, all the patients had various and multiple infections, whether they were in group one that improved or group two that did not improve, uh, again, treatment was varied. All of these others had strep infections. You can see Lyme, mycoplasma, herpes virus, parvovirus, Bartonella, strep, lots and lots of different infections. That tends to be the case with patients that have these disorders. And so there was no difference between group one who improved and group two that did not as far as their symptoms, uh, decreased concentration, OCD, sensory abnormalities, et cetera, uh, they all had very similar percentages of these different types of symptoms. So in the groups that did improve, but prior to treatment, here's what their panel results looked like. Every one of them had one or more positives in the panel. And this is important because this is how we can identify whether or not they're immune mediated 
versus some type of genetic or other biological. Those that improved actually post-treatment or completely resolved um, vast decrease in the number of positives and degree of positivity. And you can see the number of positive tests decrease. Very similarly, I don't have time to show that. The negative was just the opposite, those that did not improve. But what that gave us was an accuracy of 86% in identifying the correlation between having these antibodies and their uh, uh, symptoms and then resolution of symptoms and the antibodies gone. We were able to do some uh, logistic regression and weight these differently and uh, outcoming will be able to uh, have an increase in accuracy of up to 90%. So just very briefly, here is the correlation that we have found in over 15,000 patients now that we have tested. Uh, when antibodies are directed against the dopamine D1 or the D2 receptor, again, these are in the brain and the basal ganglia, that we find that psychiatric symptoms tend to correlate with those that are against the D1. Mood instability, anxiety, irritability, and other types of symptoms. These are all present uh, and, and will be available in uh, the report that gets printed. So when they're against the dopamine D2, we find that they're more associated with different types of movement, such as the choreiform movement and other types of hyperactivity. We also see some sleep disturbances and other types of sensory or abnormalities. But when patients have antibodies directed against these two targets, these are the most common symptoms we see. When they're directed against the tubulin, and tubulin, by the way, is an intracellular protein inside heavily concentrated in the neuronal cells in the brain, we find that they're in association with obsessive compulsive disorders, cognitive interference, and mostly complaints of what people call brain fog. And so we see that with other types of aggressive behaviors, behavioral regression, and even motor tics. The fourth target, which is called lysoganglioside GM1, which is the myelin sheath uh, around the nerves, uh, heavily concentrated there, we find that when antibodies are directed against them, that they're associated with tics, motor tics, vocal tics, joint pain and connective tissue pain, other sleep disturbances and sensory abnormalities. So when antibodies are directed against this part, we tend to see these symptoms associated with them. When antibodies are directed against a part of the brain cell that stimulates this enzyme called CAM kinase, we find that they're associated with fight or flight behavior, separation anxiety, urinary problems, sensory abnormalities. And we are researching into what is actually the target, but we do know that these antibodies will stimulate that enzyme in brain cells in our laboratory when we run this testing. We also find that sometimes we really see a correlation with uh, an active infection or a recurrent infection. We don't know what the infection is, but there tends to be some uh, association with that. And it's being published that the role of CAM kinase is involved in various neuropsychiatric disorders, such as schizophrenia, epilepsy, neurodevelopment disorders, and others. And it's involved in a pathway that I won't go through in detail, many other targets in the brain. So if you're interested, we have many publications showing how these targets of these antibodies are uh, present in patients uh, or portions of patients that have autism spectrum disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar, chronic depression. Now, not all of them, but only a, a subset of them. And in this particular graphic, what it illustrates is that we, the goal is to identify those that have an infection-triggered autoimmune etiology versus those that do not, that can be treated with traditional psychotropic drugs. Whereas these individuals, in order to respond and improve, are treated with immune modulators and other types of anti-infectives or uh, anti-inflammatory agents. Just very briefly, what are these treatments and what are these therapies? Well, they include and fall into really four buckets. Things that will treat the infection, because sometimes they don't even know that they have an infection. Sometimes they're very subclinical, 
and they don't have symptoms of an infection. But when the test is positive, we find that they do. Anti-inflammatory agents, things that will reduce the inflammation. Immune modulators, things that will uh, modulate the immune system. And then of course, symptomatic treatments. Now there are many that are listed here. The, these are uh, FDA approved drugs, but typically we find that uh, regardless of the particular uh, drug, the category is important. Things that will reduce the infection, reduce the inflammation, modulate or uh, improve the immune uh, homeostasis is important. And so there could be many, many other types of treatments that would be effective. Overall, here's the summary. Basically, you want to identify and look for all these infections. If the Cunningham panel is positive, you want to rule out that there are no other infections. You want to look for these infections because they're the ones that are triggering the immune system, provide symptomatic relief, treat the inflammation, and then treat the immune dysfunction or dysregulation. If you're looking for other types of uh, treatment guidance protocol, particularly for pandas and pans, this journal of child and adolescent psychopharmacology or the PANDAS Physician Network has them available. And they're a series of four articles that describe the consensus for treatment, at least at this time, for PANDAS and PANS. So in summary, we find that there's an emergence of this interconnection between uh, the infectious agents and even some non-infectious agents that can obviously include bacteria, virus, parasites, microbiome, and even the environmental factors, and what it does to the immune system. SARS-CoV-2, long COVID has showed us that that's the case. But what about things like chronic fatigue, myalgic encephalomyelitis, other types of conditions that are also immune mediated? And then the effect of these on the brain, but in the context of a genetic predisposition to immune system dysfunction. So this complex pathway, or I should say this, this particular axis of this pathway is something that may apply, and we do believe it'll apply to many other chronic disorders in which patients are seeking answers but are not getting a lot of medical help or, or resolution. So one thing that I can share with you is that there is a conference that will be uh, occurring in uh, November 8th to the 10th, uh, and it will be also available as a webinar. Uh, it occurs in Washington, D.C. If you're wanting to attend, it'll be in person. It's about new developments in understanding chronic illnesses and the role of immune dysfunction and infections. So we'll be discussing and talking about this whole constellation of different types of conditions, the activation of the immune system, uh, encephalitis, pandas and pans, how these things work together, uh, chronic fatigue, um, myalgic encephalomyelitis. Uh, and here is the link um, that will be available that you can register. And with that, I want to thank you for listening. Um, our partner, AONM, there uh, is uh, fully ready to help if you're interested, if you need more information. Uh, their website is there. Their email address is info at aonm.org and their phone number is there. So thank you for uh, your help and your interest in this area. And I'm happy to answer any questions um, if, uh, if I can. Thank you so much, Craig. That was absolutely fascinating and um, so, so important and, and largely so unknown still in many countries of the world. Very, very clear as well. Really great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we do have some questions, and um, I'll, I'll start in no particular order. Um, one of them is, how commonly do you see exposure to mold in a water-damaged building as a trigger for PANS or for abnormal results on the Cunningham panel? Yeah, that's uh, something that we're actually working with some uh, clinicians on. Uh, publications on that are few. But practically, uh, from clinicians, we do see and do hear that that uh, is a trigger. And uh, 
Uh, obviously, mold can cause uh, various types of things like mast cell activation syndrome that impacts the immune system. So we do believe that that's the case. And as long as the patients are producing these antibodies that are directed against these targets, we will pick it up in the Cunningham panel. So it's irrespective of the offending organism, but more directed towards do we see the result of an infection or different types of infections uh, resulting in targets against these particular five targets I mentioned. Um, but that is another area that we're researching because we typically do see that there are, in many cases, mold involvement, um, but there also may be other types of infections on top of that with, a, a, let's call it a compromised immune system. So we do see that, and yes, definitely uh, mold in the case that's producing mycotoxins, which are known to cause, in, in many cases, even direct neurological issues too. Thank you. Um, several questions um, about where this test can be accessed in the UK. Just to mention again that um, it's actually from the Academy of Nutritional Medicine, AONM, and um, Professor Shimazaki did have the details at the end of his presentation. But what we'll do is give them to you again at the end of this um, webinar, I think. Uh, it's AONM.org and um, we'll give you the telephone number and the email address again at the end. Um, so there is someone asking whether, uh, you know, what type of blood is needed, uh, whether it's serum or not. It is actually, uh, maybe you could just say a few words about the very special type of blood collection that's needed. Yes, right. um, so we do have a special type of collection tube that does not have any kind of excipients in them. And so it is a red top glass tube. And so what we will collect or ask for is two red top tubes filled with blood, but um, separated uh, by a serum. So the serum is what comes to us. AONM is very good at uh, working with uh, those uh, recipients and people who are interested in that because other tubes uh, tend to have uh, other types of what we call excipients that can and do interfere with some of the complex testing that we do. Unfortunately, sometimes that results in erroneous results um, that we address, which is why we uh, do not accept uh, specimens unless they are collected in this manner. Thank you. Thank you. And we do actually ask the phlebotomist or nurse to sign on the form that it's been collected uh, correctly because of these issues that you've mentioned. Um, going back to uh, the other causes of this, uh, there is a question on whether you could elaborate uh, the non-infectious triggers of autoimmune encephalitis. For example, can food allergy even trigger this? It, it is believed that food allergies can play a role in it. I, I don't know of any specific publications that have directly shown that. Uh, it could be whether it's correlation or causation because the epithelial lining around the blood barrier, barrier, barrier and in the gut, uh, very similar uh, endothelial lining that if they're breached in the brain, typically you will also see gut dysbiosis. So you will also see food allergies, uh, but definitely it's something that is uh, correlated with that, whether it's actually the cause because uh, they would have to actually then traverse into the brain uh, I don't know of any direct uh, publications, but it is one of those things that typically make you think, okay, this patient has a susceptibility to some immune dysfunction, and then often you may find that's the case. Thank you. And another question here, can vaccines induce autoimmunity like infections do? Um, here, here the uh, person asking the question does cite a study from Norway stating that a vaccine trial of meningococcal vaccine appeared to do that. But um, what's your... Yeah, you know, categorically, um, they have the potential to do that. And, and there are examples. Uh, for instance, um, we do... Make sure. Sorry, I got a little interruption there. Um, categorically, yes, because they're antigens um, that the immune system is going to make to and it make antibodies to. And if they make them against an epitope that's cross-reactive, yes. 
So narcolepsy is a good example. You see narcolepsy that's occurred in vaccinations and specific types of vaccinations because of the presentation. Uh, and narcolepsy is known to be an immune-mediated dysfunction. And when that particular uh, vaccine is no longer used, you don't see that. Now, not everybody, again, makes those antibodies against that. Um, but because of just the process of immunogenicity and in the context of a patient that has a susceptibility uh, to uh, maybe not tolerance in the sense of uh, eliminating these uh, autoantibodies, uh, we do see that that is the case. Um, typically, it is more rare, um, but just uh, immunologically, uh, that can happen. Thank you. And could Ehler-Danlos syndrome, EDS, with insufficient collagen synthesis and reduced blood-brain barrier, um, be a risk factor for inducing autoimmune encephalopathies? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, we do find uh, that EDS is associated in patients that have positive antibodies against the Cunningham panel. Um, now, whether that is a factor in causing it or if it's something that occurs in the context of it, uh, we don't know. Um, but definitely uh, there we do have instances of that being present or co-present when patients are positive for the Cunningham panel. Thank you. And um, do infections affect all parts of the brain or is it usually just the basal ganglia? So what we're referring to is really an immune-mediated result. So these are not direct infection, and maybe that was really the question that was asked. Is, uh, so there's viral encephalitis. We're not, we're not, in this case, talking about viral encephalitis, but we're talking about viral uh, or bacterial-triggered autoimmune encephalitis. So, uh, and, the, and the answer, the rest of the answer to that is, that they can, these organisms can trigger uh, antibodies that can be directed against other parts of the brain. And in fact, um, some of these other conditions that occurred with even in perineal plastic, like stiff man syndrome and all these other, like GAD65 and um, uh, NMDR receptor encephalitis. Uh, if you know about Brain on Fire, the book or the movie, that was NMDR encephalitis, which was uh, against a different target, but these are more rare. Those targets are more rare. So the answer is yes, they can be directed against other targets. Um, and it just happens to be in this case, the, let's call it the unlucky draw of what these tolerance and these antibodies are being made against in the context of a person uh, with an immune uh, dysregulation. Thank you. And is there any information on what the proportion is of sudden onset OCD that is PANS and PANDAS um, related versus non-infective? Yeah, you know, the environmental piece um, is not well defined in literature. Um, it is, it is uh, implicated in as a contributing um, factor um, so if you think about uh, one physician describes it as boiling cauldron in a pot. So you have this immune propensity dysfunction. You have stressors. You have, let's say, other allergies, other types of um, physical environmental stressors, and maybe you get an infection. Or maybe it's all of these other stressors, and then you've got something triggered. So... Um, it is not well defined what these external environmental factors are, but definitely we know with toxins in the environment, exposures to various kinds of toxins over time in a susceptible individual, it, it, it would um, be a very possible, plausible um, condition that could occur. Thank you. There are quite a few questions uh, relating to therapy, and um, one of them I will ask, though we will be having further rounds on therapy this year, um, and um, we just talked about that before this uh, call with uh, Professor Shimazaki. That's that's going to be a definite. But does vitamin D status and genetic metabolism play a role in these autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders? Well, definitely, um, genetics does play a role. 
uh, metabolism and vitamin D status. It almost seemed like vitamin D, the vitamin D receptor is involved in a lot of things, uh, e even in um, some cases, single nucleotide polymorphisms in breast cancer and other things we know in COVID. Vitamin D levels were greatly decreased in those that actually had more severe infections. So uh, vitamin D status does, um, but it could also be um, then the, the processing of that. Uh, genetic metabolism, uh, certainly we see that in cases such as maybe different types of autism uh, in um, different types of uh, conditions that affect because autism is a spectrum. Um, so it, it, definitely, I think that that's a, a very good possibility. And those of you that are clinicians at the front line would be much better able to answer that uh, because you see these patients uh, and, and know that. But uh, these are factors that definitely could play a role in that. Yeah, there's an interesting question here. Um, might the Cunningham panel be expanded in the future to attempt to identify the actual triggers for the abnormal results? Or, or would you say that that is also already to a certain extent included within the panel? There is a lot that's included in the panel because we pick up the thing that these other rare targets don't pick up. Um, now, we are constantly looking at through research and uh, the thousands of specimens that we have and are studying, uh, such as what really is the target for uh, activating the calmodulin cam kinase. Uh, are there other uh, indicators that would let us know whether or not the blood-brain barrier is open? Um, those are kinds of things that we look into and want to look into and uh, to better help a clinician be able to use the results to know what to do. And so in that, in that regard, we're also working with an artificial intelligence company to take the 15,000 records that we have of patients who have uh, been tested and treated and find out, can we help narrow down what the optimal treatment might be based on a patient's results before they ever get treatment? Uh, of course, all this takes money and uh, research and time. So uh, I, I'm out raising some of that so that we can actually continue to do that. But it is something that we are looking into and something we hope to be able to add to. But for now, it does cover quite a bit um, that has been helpful in a lot of patients and clinicians treating their patients. That, that further cooperation sounds like it will be very, very useful and important as well. Thank you. Um, after IVIG treatment or whatever therapy is used um, so that one notices successful resolution of symptoms, should the panel return to normal levels? Yes, and that's one of the indicators that many of the clinicians will use is um, I've treated the patient, they appear to be well, they're doing better, but I'd like to know for sure. And uh, or in many cases, these become publications and we work with many uh, clinicians on these publications um, it's because sometimes they might have improved, but they maybe did not completely get rid of uh, all of the immune dysregulation or in, in the case of an infection that might be subclinical. So it does help. Um, again, that's something that's really based on the clinician and the patient's interest. Um, but it is something that many of our physicians do use, and they do that um, to monitor their treatment and uh, the effectiveness of their treatment. Thank you. Um, there are further questions, as I say, relating to the therapies. For example, are there any new emerging treatments for these autoimmune encephalopathies? But I think it would probably be fairer to bring you on another time together with one or several of your clinicians to go into that in greater detail, would you say? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, because I'm quite sure, well, I mean, there are, of course, but um, that needs time, doesn't it, to discuss. So any, any final words that you'd like to leave us with today? Well, um, the reason that we started the company and the reason that it's here is because of the suffering of patients who have, in many cases, have uh, been uh, back and forth to as many as five to 15 doctors before ever finding an answer. So our goal is to help uh, and understand what the underlying root is and then be able to help uh, clinicians direct treatment and therapy 
for their patients. So we're always open um, to questions or comments or suggestions. And uh, we greatly appreciate the partnership with AONN, MN in the UK and uh, the surrounding countries because um, a lot of this is things that uh, mainly was not around or not understood you know, several decades ago. And often many clinicians, uh, you know, did not get that in medical school. And so uh, we're, our goal is to help, uh, help change how medicine is practiced for these neuropsychiatric and behavioral disorders. Tremendous, thank you very, very much. It's so valuable and so unique as well. I know you're the only laboratory in the world doing these tests. Um, just to mention again that um, the uh, email address of the, uh, hub for this testing in the UK is AONM, the Academy of Nutritional Medicine. Um, that's AONM.org. And our web address, um, well, the, the address to write to, the shortest one would be info at AONM.org. And um, we will be sending out a um, notification of the recording when it's up, which will be in just a couple of days, to everybody who's been on the webinar today. And so um, you will get all the full details there. I'll just share one slide, if I may, um, to show you all the um, upcoming webinars that um, we have for this month, because it's a very special month. It's Lyme Awareness Month. And so we've got, uh, unusually, uh, a webinar almost every week, including a prize draw as well for um, Lyme testing, which again, you will see in the upcoming um, notification that you get if you haven't already received it. So we have Professor Leona Gilbert and Marcus Berger talking about scientific evidence to support the use of phytochemicals for Lyme borreliosis on the 16th of May. Dr. Joseph Jemsek and Professor Robert Bransfield talking about the convergence of two pandemics, Lyme disease and COVID-19 on the 23rd of May. And on the 31st of May, Dr. Armin Schwarzbach talking about the, an, giving an overview on the occurrence of Lyme and co-infections over the pandemic. So um, that will be absolutely fascinating. And then Going on to June, we have uh, the herbalist Julia Behrens talking about her new book and the therapeutic use of plants in supporting patients with Lyme disease. So um, a lot ahead for this month. And thank you, everybody. We've overrun the hour a little bit, but thank you, everyone, for being with us this evening, for taking the time. And most of all, Professor Shimazaki, thank you so much. I'll stop sharing now and very much look forward to seeing you again later in the year to talk Thank about you. therapies as much as everything else. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh -huh. Bye now. Bye-bye.